So thank you all uh, for coming to tonight's talk. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jonathan Rothwell, who is a principal economist with Gallup and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute. Uh, his presentation tonight is, uh, I guess, a synopsis of his rather wonderful book from late 2019, A Republic of Equals. Besides the book, Jonathan also writes for New York Times Upshot, uh, and he told me to keep the introduction very brief, so that's all I'm going to say, and over to you, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jason, and, and I want to thank the Gerhardt Center and, and Ali for inviting me. It's an it's a honor to be able to present this, this research to you all, and I hope you, you find it uh, meaningful. I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to share my screen. If you bear with me for just a second, I've got some slides that I think will uh, make it easier to, to follow along here. So, uh, Jason, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, I'll just do a slideshow and I'll start from the beginning. So here's a cover of the book, and um, the first chapter really looks at the, the fact that the United States stands out in the world, especially among rich democratic countries for its extreme levels of income inequality. And not only uh, is income inequality very high now in the United States with the top 1% of, of income earners, earning roughly 20% of, of income. It's increased, according to all uh, measures, from roughly around 1980. There's some debate in the literature about when inequality took off in the United States and, and whether it was, some people argue it was higher in, in the 70s and 80s than, than these data suggest. These data, by the way, are from Tomas Piketty and his collaborators at the World Inequality Database. Uh, but in any case, there's a consensus that inequality is very high in the United States and that it's, it's increased. I, I think the best evidence says it's doubled since 1980. And so uh, these, this raises a, a lot of important issues as to how in, in a democratic country you can have such extreme levels of income inequality. And so the, the, the first chapter of the book really tries to, to delve into what's been going on over this 40 year period and what is distinct about the United States relative to, to other OECD countries and, and democratic countries. So uh, just to clarify about where income has gone, it's not that it's only gone to the richest 1% and it's, it's, it's increased to some extent among people in the top 10 percentile of the income distribution. And uh, it's come at the expense of people at the bottom, uh, say below the median, so below the 50th percentile. The, the, the measurements suggest that they lost income from 1978 to 2014. So their, their share of income went from, uh, uh, fell 8.6 percentage points. And even those below the 90th, so those below the top 10 saw, saw a loss. Uh, but then there were sizable gains going to those between the 95th and the 99th percentile. So to be in this group, uh, to, in, to put this in, in terms of US dollars, you have to earn about $119,000 a year. So a lot of professionals would fall into that category of being in the, in the top 5%, but not at the top one. And then if you look at the next rung, which is those who are in the top one, but not in the top 0.01, uh, you have to earn at least $295,000 a year. And that group has also seen sizable gains. So the point of this is it's not just billionaires, it's not just uh, tech founders and so on, it's uh, prof professionals and especially what I would refer to as elite professionals who are, who, are, who are very top income earners. And I'm going to go into a lot more detail about, about who they are. But of course you do see very big gains for those who are making a million dollars or more. Uh, and that's the, the top 0 0.01. So uh, one thing to, to, that I want to emphasize here is that uh, because 
of these income gains disproportionately playing out across the distribution, the wealth gap has also increased sizably over this time. And one of the things we see is that people below the median of the income distribution are having to borrow money and are living with debt typically. Whereas those who uh, are at the top are, are not only saving money, but investing it and earning a, a healthy return, either in the stock market or in hedge funds, as I'll go into later. Now I want to summarize some of the, what I call the conventional explanations for income inequality and uh, as a way to uh, say why I think a lot of these have it wrong or what, what aspects they have wrong. Sometimes they're not, in my view, not entirely wrong, but uh, have some serious limitations. So in the economics literature, one of the most conventional explanations for the rise of income inequality in the United States and, and as well as other rich countries is skill bias technological change. And so the, the thinking behind this is that the rise of information technology uh, in, in the 1980s uh, coincides with a sharp rise in the advantages, income advantages of having a college degree or, or advanced degree. And you start to see a, a big gap emerge between those with just a high school diploma, which is a secondary degree in the United States and those with what we call a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree or higher. And the thinking is that people with the higher levels of education are, are taking advantage of information technology. They can use it uh, you know, for, for a variety of purposes and it's made them more productive. So it's essentially arguing that product, their higher educated people are more productive and technology has made them more productive. And it's also put some downward pressure on wages at the lower end by allowing workers to be replaced by machines and, and production and so on. And that's that's explains the, the big rise in inequality. Uh, one major problem with that explanation is that it doesn't explain trends with, within education with, or within what you call skill groups. So there are, for example, massive differences between the earnings, as, as I'll get into, between people with graduate levels of education in the United States uh, where and across professional occupations and, and across industries. So just because somebody has a PhD in, in uh, computer science or, or biology or engineering or English literature or history uh, doesn't mean they're going to be at the top of the income distribution. Really what matters is whether they're working for a hedge fund or whether they're in a licensed occupation that enjoys uh, various privileges that I'll get into later. And then another explanation that is commonly brought up as to why income inequality has increased in the last 40 years is, is globalization. And the, the thinking here is that people who are very highly skilled can, can now sell to a much larger audience than they could before trade barriers fell and before information technology made it possible to digitize works of art or intellectual property. A big problem with this explanation is that it can't explain international patterns or the prominence of, of some of these domestic uh, uh, industry groups that, that, I, that I'm emphasizing. So when you look across countries, you see that most, most of the high earners are not in international industries and sectors. They're really in, in sectors that are focused on domestic customers. And, uh, and while it is appealing to, to think that you know, famous celebrities or artists or soccer players, or as we call them, <laughs> football players, as you call them, sure, uh, are really behind income inequality. When you, when you look at the number of people who are in that group in, in either the United States or around the world, it's, it's very small slice. So it can't really explain the trends. And then some other uh, explanations um, have to do more with institutions, which uh, to me make gets closer to what's going on. Uh, but one that's gotten a lot of attention in the United States, but I think maybe too much attention is is the fact that that union unionization, worker unions, have declined uh, as, in, in terms of membership share of, of of the economy. A big part of that is has to do with the fact that most labor union workers were affiliated with the manufacturing sector in the United States. And manufacturing has, has declined 
since the 1970s as a share of, of, of employment. Uh, the, and so if, if declining unions were directly to the, the cause of this, what you'd expect to see is that the, the industries that used to have a lot of labor union workers uh, shifted their income from workers to business owners uh, and, and top managers. Uh, but th the fact is that manufacturing as a share of, of elite income earners has, has fallen. And, and so it's, it can't be attributed to the manufacturing sector, the rise of income inequality in the United States. Uh, and what you see is that many sectors that have the highest percentage of, of top income earners were, were never really unionized, such as the financial sector. So, so some have argued that there are more indirect effects. Um, we can get into some discussion of, of that uh, if, if you'd like where uh, you know, federal legislation, for example, might uh, favor rich interest groups more than it used to because the labor unions were not, were not supporting uh, you know, federal policies and electing officials to, to counteract some of these forces. And there, I think that's a more compelling story, but I think it also has some flaws. Uh, another common explanation has to do with taxes. Uh, the, the marginal tax rates have fallen for the super rich and for the even the normal rich uh, with tax reforms over the last few decades in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, uh, non-tax, you know, pre-tax income inequality is really what I've been focusing on this in, in the book, and that's uh, continued to increase quite a bit. And the, the, the shifts uh, don't quite line up in terms of when income inequality increase and when these tax reforms happen. So a lot of the reforms happened decades before uh, the rise in income inequality. Uh, and there's uh, some other uh, other uh, aspects that are worth pointing out here is, is that there's a strong correlation between uh, racial diversity and income inequality as documented by some Brown University economists. And here, this, this raises the possibility that discrimination, uh, ethnic and racial discrimination, might be playing a role in income inequality. And I spend a lot of time in the book uh, going into why I think this is playing an important role. And then uh, the other problem with conven conventional theories often ignore racial and ethnic differences in access to labor market and skill development. And then there's uh, also no explanation for why U.S. income inequality was much, much higher even before this period, say in the 1980s, uh, if globalization and skill-based technological change are the main things that make the U.S. special and unique in terms of income inequality, then why was it already very unequal compared to, say, Scandinavian countries or some of the more egalitarian OECD countries before then? So with that, let me just quickly review just a little bit of the evidence for some, some of my claims that the conventional explanations don't quite work. Here's a measure of, of trade as a share of GDP. So the, the, the horizontal axis is exports plus imports divided by GDP. And the uh, vertical axis is the Gini coefficient for income inequality measured in 2016 or closest available year. You can see there's a negative relationship. So it's actually that the countries that are more globally integrated in terms of having a, a larger share of trade have, tend to have lower levels of income inequality. The United States is, uh, despite the fact that it's famous for exporting Facebook and Google and Apple and uh, it's, it's our, our tech companies, uh, much of our economy is is domestically oriented, and, uh, and we're not as as integrated by that measure uh, as as many other OECD countries. Then, likewise, if you look at patenting rates as a measure of innovation, these are looking at pat the number of patents per capita. Uh, you see a, a lot of uh, rather egalitarian uh, northern Euro northern Western European countries, as well as Japan. Uh, scoring very high in terms of patents per capita, and uh, some of the most unequal countries in the world scoring very low. So this also doesn't suggest that 
innovation is driving income inequality. It doesn't rule out the possibility, but it's just a correlation, but it's, it's harder to tell a story when the uh, raw correlation goes the opposite direction. And then uh, this looks at corporate profits as a share of GDP. And here, there's also a, a somewhat weak and even negative relationship between income inequality and, and corporate profits as a share of GDP. And, and I'll get into some of this uh, later, but the fact is that corporations actually count for less of, of GDP in the United States now than they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, what, we, what we see instead is the rise of, of, of businesses that are organized as partnerships or what are called S corporations, which aren't publicly traded and they're owned by a very small number of individuals. And they tend to be in sectors like healthcare and legal services and finance, uh, we're not publicly traded companies. And so this again does not you know, support the idea that globalization is, is really causing the rise of income inequality at the high levels in the United States. And then uh, here's, a, here's a, 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 a chart showing OECD averages for the share of top 1% that are our managers. And so this is include CEOs as well as other executives and all the way down to, to mid-level managers. And the average for the OECD is that 37% of people in the top 1% uh, fall into this category. In the United States, it's slightly lower at 35%, but you know, roughly the same. And I, I point out it's, it's, it's about third with the latest census data. Uh, in contrast to the, the Luxembourg income study data that I used for, to create this chart. Uh, but in any case, it's it's certainly not the majority of people that are even uh, managers or CEOs. And then if you look at the manufacturing sector, the average is 18%, the, the US is, is 14%. And so the you know, US doesn't stand out for having a high level of managers or a high level of people in manufacturing in the top. Where the U.S. does stand out is it has a, uh, a sharp relationship between the incomes of professionals uh, relative to the median worker. And so this chart plots the, the 90th percentile professional income earner wages against the median worker and Israel and the United States uh, score uh, as the two highest countries with comparable data. And they also have high levels of income inequality, whereas countries like Denmark and Iceland are in the, the, the bottom uh, quadrant here. And what that means is that their top earning professionals earn just slightly more than uh, the, the median worker. And then um, this gets to uh, this. I spent a, a lot of time in the book analyzing what's going on with, with occupations and industries. And uh, I want to challenge this idea that pay is based cl very closely on productivity, which is kind of the standard assumption in, in economic models. And one way of measuring skill and pro potential productivity is looking at education. That's a proxy that many economists use and, and because education is correlated with, with many things that were thought to uh, be associated with productivity, including cognitive ability. And uh, that is meant to be even a more finely grained measure of skill than education. And when you look at uh, globally using data from the OECD study of adult competencies, which measures literacy, numeracy, and uh, ease in, in sophistication with using technology, and you score, use this as a score of cognitive it does predict income all around the world. And that people who score higher tend to earn more money, just as people who are more educated tend to earn more money around the world. But when you rank occupations using this, you see you don't see that CEOs and some of the highest paid occupations are are, are outperforming uh, a bunch of other workers, and that that explains why they're they're paid more. In fact, you see people in say information and communications technology pr professions scoring very high. On, uh, on these cognitive ability exams. You see people in teaching professions, not, not, not surprisingly scoring very high. And, uh, and yet they're, uh, 
not compensated nearly as much as as, as CEOs or or people in the uh, restricted occupations, as, as I argue. Plus, the the range of scores across these occupations is is not very high, in in my opinion. Uh, and so, even the the lowest scoring, lowest skilled occupations, um, if you were to extend the the distribution to include the full range, this is just showing the average. If you included, say, the 75th percentile, there's a lot of overlap between these professions. So the point is that even people in the lowest skilled occupations, many of them have the literacy skills and numeracy skills to be in the, the higher paying occupations. They, they just lack perhaps the formal training. And then uh, to make the point even clearer, if you look at the uh, cognitive ability scores and normalize them so that the mean is 100, uh, you get that the top 1% have slightly higher scores across the world, so 108. So that's a standard deviation using this kind of metric is 15 points. So that's about half a standard deviation. In the US, it's, it's, they're barely above the average. Uh, and then the U.S. CEOs and CEOs generally are scoring barely above the average. So uh, it makes it hard to say that CEOs are, are compensated uh, the way they are because they're just sort of inherently brilliant or uh, it's, it's much more likely. I mean, this is not to diminish the fact that the CEOs have very specific skills that are important that they've acquired through experience. Uh, through their social networks that are hard to replicate. But if you're just looking at uh, their literacy skills and numeracy skills, they do not stand out. And those tend to be the things that economists emphasize when they look at skill bias, technological change. So to get into a little bit more detail on who's in the top 1% in the United States and how it's changed, uh, I created this chart, which shows that healthcare professionals and people who manage hospitals and health clinics comprise a very large percentage of those in the top 1% and, and it's increased. So 19% uh, using 2017 data of all people in the top 1% in the United States, uh, being, the being income earners are in the healthcare professions as well as managers of hospitals. And that's even larger than uh, managers in, in all other sectors of the economy not shown here which would be 17.5%. If you look at just financial services, so this would be managers, but every worker in financial services, you get 17.4% of the top 1%. And that's really has increased a lot. That's That's gone up from 9% to 17.4%. For healthcare, there's been some increase as well, not as dramatic. Uh, if you look at manufacturing, there's a decrease, as I mentioned earlier. So 17.5% uh, of uh, people in the top 1% were in manufacturing in 1980, but it's fallen to about 10% in the most recent data. Lawyers and legal services have maintained a, a fairly sizable chunk, around 7% in both periods. And then uh, you can see people in information have increased slightly, uh, but still a very small percentage at 3.2%. And uh, if you just isolate CEOs from the set of all managers, you get 11% of the top 1% are CEOs in the United States. So the, the point is that you know, it's, it's, it's it not to deny that it's good to be a CEO, and uh, there are a lot of rich CEOs in the United States, but rough almost 90% of people who are in the top 1% are not CEOs, and, and many work in healthcare, financial services, and legal services. And if you group together what I call professional elites, you get uh, about half of 1% and falling into these sectors. And so here, here's some recent analysis from uh, the Quarterly Journal of Economics leading uh, publication. Uh, among the top 0.1%, 84% earn pass-through income. That is uh, 139,000 taxpayers. Uh, and uh, this this is important because this kind of income is earned not by people who own stocks in publicly traded firms, but it's, it's closely held enterprises. So these are the kinds of you know, firms I was talking about earlier that uh, are common among consultants, lawyers, 
uh, and, and people in healthcare services, so physicians and dentists in the United States. And they say a typical uh, firm owned by the top 1% to 0.1% are single establishment firms in these professional service groups. And, and so what one of the, after that, that what I just presented is most of the first chapter or two, what I want to, uh, uh, you, you want to think about is, is kind of a thought exercise I introduced a bit later in the book, where we think of, it's a challenge to this idea that skill is, is the fundamental determinant of, of the income distribution, that uh, the reason we have such high income inequality in the United States is because we have big differences in skills. Uh, what happens if you assigned income based only on IQ or cognitive ability uh, measured through a variety of different ways, but in, in, in this instance through uh, a, a pretty standard exam that people take in, in the United States. Uh, and also, you assign it based on personality because there are personality traits like conscientiousness and extroversion and emotional stability that are consistently predictive of success in the labor market and higher levels of health and age and years of education. So if you if you just took these, these attributes of people and assigned income based on how well they do on, on, on those uh, enduring you know, dimensions, uh, you might say, would the, would the US income in inequality increase? Would it decrease? Would it stay the same? And the, the answer is it would decrease quite a lot. And so here's a uh, exercise that I published uh, in the New York Times in a summary of the book. So the, the, the left-hand side shows the distribution of, of income by decile. So 30% of income is in the top decile. And the right-hand side shows just the results of this thought exercise. If you were to allocate income based on these measures of literacy, numeracy, which Right, which I mean is cognitive ability, as well as these uh, kind of personality traits and education and age, you get a, a pretty sizable reduction in income inequality. Uh, and so people at the top would, would have considerably less income. And then uh, here's a, uh, the way I th think of this as a political economy explanation for income wealth distribution. So what you could think of as talent or the skills that people develop and then eventually apply in the labor market comes from some combination of, of their genetics, although there's I spent a lot of time in the book emphasizing that it's a very small contribution. It doesn't explain any group differences. Family investments and interactions from early childhood to nutritional access, things like that. And then things that come through public investment, including early childhood education that has access to high quality public schooling. And uh, also you could say the environment uh, that they grow up in, in terms of uh, exposure to toxins versus healthy air versus healthy water and uh, things like that. So there's that component. And then there's uh, the family component itself has, has, access, has elements of, of power because not every family uh, has, has access to the same types of, of investments for, for reasons that I go into in a lot of detail in the book, but racial disc discrimination is, is a major factor. And then of course the public investments are also uh, subject to, to power constraints. If, if politically disempowered groups are not able to marshal the resources that politically powerful groups are, they're not going to get access to the highest quality schools or neighborhoods and so on. And so income depends on uh, some aspects of, of what I'm calling talent here. Uh, but then it also depends on uh, these ascribed group characteristics because those are associated with political power. And one of them is, is what class or, or uh, what occupational class, what industry class you're in. And uh, that give some groups uh, opportunities to earn what the economics literature calls rents. So this is kind of a tax on the rest of everyone else uh, where they can charge more for their services because they are not subject to the same kinds of levels of competition. So the, 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 the broad thesis here is the distribution of income will be more equal if people are rewarded based strictly on observe performance measures, ability or value to society, any of those kinds of things you can think about as, as ways that 
people could be compensated because these measures of talent, if you like, vary much less than the actual income distribution today. And uh, there are reasons for unequal access to development of talent. Some of them are race-based disinvestment in human capital and wealth. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the United States going through the history of, of what are called Jim Crow laws, which discriminated very strongly against African Americans in particular. Uh, but there are other, there were more, uh, other immigrant, immigrant groups were discriminated against in less severe ways. And there are forms of class-based discrimination that persists, especially in the housing market. Um, and I'll, I can go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, but anyway, there's unequal access to the development of talent, and then there's unequal access to the realization of talent. And that's where these industry groups uh, come into play. And I, I know I'm running short on time here, and so I want to make sure we have some, some moments for discussion. Thank you, Jason. So we've got five minutes left. So let me just summarize a little bit uh, with a little bit more detail uh, why I think there's unequal access to development of talent. Uh, there's clear evidence that school quality boosts cognitive ability and also non-cognitive skills. So non-cognitive skills include those kind of personality traits you could, you could describe Angela Duckworth, the psychologist, described them as grit, uh, but you could also think of them as, as uh, self-discipline, uh, emotional stability. Uh, so act, having high quality early childhood experiences, both formally through school, but also informally influence how, how well you do on those measures. And then there are, there's very strong evidence that neighborhoods affect upward mobility. So conditional on what where you're born in the income distribution, your chances of moving up by the time you reach adulthood are strongly affected by where you grew up in the United States. And um, school quality, one of the reasons for that is school quality, uh, because the way that schooling is done in, in the United States and probably mostly around the world is that you go to the school that's in your neighborhood and you all, your peers and your social influences are also strongly affected by who's in your neighborhood. In the United States, the, your treatment uh, from public officials, such as police officers, is strongly affected by what neighborhood you live in, uh, and as well as your race. So school quality is unequally distributed as a result of class and racial segregation, which is very high in the United States. And here's a plot uh, showing historic data on African American neighborhood segregation. So you can see uh, the, the Civil War was in the 18, 1860s. Uh, and then for a time, levels of segregation were, were fairly low. But this is not to say that the conditions were great for African Americans. There, in the South, there was very formal uh, institutions of discrimination. But uh, Black people still lived near white people in the South in the uh, 1890s and early 20th century. But then the, the restrictions grew uh, as, as a result of, of uh, Black people leaving the South and going to the North. It's called the Great Migration. A lot of Black people fled the very stringent uh, uh, prohibitions against working in professional occupations, for example, that were prevalent in the South. And the, the access to education was very, was very poor in the South. And so, Many black people moved north for opportunity, but what happened is that the cities in the north started creating restrictions uh, where they made it illegal in many cases to sell your home to a black person through what are called deed restrictions, which are contracts between uh, a current homeowner and future homeowners. Uh, in some cities, zoning laws prohibited black people from living in certain neighborhoods. These were eventually struck down by the US Supreme Court. But other forms of zoning laws were allowed to continue. And uh, the US has very aggressive zoning laws, even to this day, that prohibit low income housing uh, or high density housing, uh, such as apartment buildings and townhouses that are attached to one another from being built in, in very rich neighborhoods. Uh, and this is common in every suburb of the United States. And so these, these kinds of restrictions grew in providence over the course of the 20th century. And segregation of black people from white people peaked in 1970. And it's come down a little bit since then with, with, because some of these laws were, 
were uh, made illegal through the Civil Rights Act of eight, the Civil Rights Acts, as well as through Supreme Court laws. But zoning laws have, have not been made illegal because the discrimination was really against lower income people, not explicitly uh, black people or people of certain racial groups. And uh, this, this compares the segregation of black people from those of, of other racial and ethnic groups over just the last uh, several decades. And uh, this, this, is, uh, this is actually a level, you could, you could interpret this as a measure of integration because it shows the share of neighborhood residents who are white in the average neighborhood of, of the given group. So uh, in 1980, 88% of uh, the neighbors for an average white person were also white. And that had fallen to 74% by 2010. Uh, but still very high. And for African Americans, it's uh, essentially uh, you have 30% in 1980, and it's gone up just slightly over the subsequent decades. Uh, it's, 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 uh, and, and for Hispanic Americans, it's gone the other direction. So uh, 1980, Hispanic Americans were slightly more likely to have white neighbors than they are today. Um, and the same is, is true with, with Asian Americans, uh, although they, it's, it's important to note that Asian Americans are, have many more white neighbors than, than both Hispanic and, and Black Americans. All right. Is, 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 we are, are we, we're probably out of time. This is showing some data. I'll just quickly summarize the last 30 seconds here. Just showing some data that exposure to high quality classrooms boosts test scores especially for, for Black American uh, children. Uh, but let me just kind of skip to the end here. Uh, the, there's, I've, I'll just skip to the very end. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the main message of the book is a, a fair society, a just society, wouldn't have such extreme income inequality because political inequality is the ultimate source of mass inequality. So if you provide equal access to skill development you, and you allow people to use those skills by accessing markets fairly, you get a, not a perfect income distribution by any means, uh, not, not a, a strictly equal income distribution, but you get one that's based largely on merit, people's interests, which of course are gonna differ. And in, importantly, you have people doing work that is meaningful to them, that matches their natural inclinations and allows them to make a decent living. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Um, do you want to take two minutes and tell us how we got from the depressing bit to the happy bit? Um, <laughs> it felt like that stage was missing and um i think people might want to hear a little more about the happy bit before they hear from me <laughs> uh, you mean uh, what to do to yes when you what say the happy bit you mean what, what to do about it or yes what is to be done how do we get to uh, a fix in mass inequality well yeah so the the, the two channels that i have here are, are skill development and skill use. So when it comes to skill development, uh, the, goal, the public policy goal should be to provide a healthy childhood development opportunities for everyone. That means in the United States, there are, there are improvements that need to be done to, to health care. There are programs that have been effective, like uh, nursing programs that uh, work with lower income. Uh, parents to to make sure that mothers have the appropriate nutrition they need, and then when the ch child is born, uh, well, first of all, have access to high quality healthcare services. But then after the child is born, have uh, access to uh, books and uh, proper nutrition. Um, and those those some of those programs have have been measured and have proven very effective. Uh, in boosting uh, cognitive ability, test scores, and kindergarten readiness for, for children. So th that's just one example, but that kind of approach of, of just th of thinking about uh, reducing inequalities in, in early child experiences, I think is, is very important, has been kind of missing from big picture analysis of the United States. And then I think really importantly is reducing economic and racial segregation. 
and the, the main mechanism I have, uh, that, which I think is crucial there, is, is what I call liberalizing housing regulations. So right now, homeowner associations dominate local governments, and they make it impossible to build a, an apartment complex or housing that would be appropriate or affordable to uh, working class families of any race in uh, the areas that have the best schools and the, 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 and the nicest park spaces and the nicest uh, resources. And so as a result, we have extreme class and economic and uh, racial segregation in the United States. And you can, uh, there's some, a lot of analysis in the book that compares the United States to other European countries and countries even with, with a fair amount of racial diversity uh, and, and cities with a fair amount of racial diversity like in London and the Netherlands and so on. And uh, the U.S. really stands out there, and I, it's, and, and I think it's because of these regulations, which, which seem to be particularly pernicious in the United States. So uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about how I think we could get rid of those laws, but um, fortunately there has been some momentum in identifying this as a major problem. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that in the next few years we can really start to try to tackle this uh, systematically. But so far, nothing's really been been done. And then um, at the, I'll just kind of skip ahead to what happens when people reach the labor market as adults. There are powerful interest groups in the United States, the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association uh, are two of them. And they're important because the, if you look, if you rank who's in the top 1% by occupation, you get doctors and lawyers who are right there at the top. And these are both groups, these groups are, are, are meant to represent the, the interests of, of doctors and lawyers, and they, they argue that their interventions uh, ensure the high quality of, of those professions in terms of the services they provide, but they've gone much further than that, and they've made it very difficult to enter the field, and they've also made it very difficult for others to compete against them. So. For example, nurse practitioners in the United States have, it's been shown through, through studies, are able to provide family and general practice primary care in a way that's very comparable to, to doctors who provide family and, and general practice care, essentially diagnosing fevers and colds and that sort of thing. And yet in most large states, nurse practitioners have to work under the supervision of a doctor and cannot open their own clinic and provide their own services. And it's also very difficult to hire a doctor. You have to be a doctor yourself in most instances. And the same is true with lawyers. And if you have a master degree in business and you're an entrepreneurial person, you want to start a legal services firm, you can't unless you're a lawyer yourself. You can't go out and hire lawyers to and start your own company that provides legal services. And what you see what we see in countries that have more relaxed standards on who can provide legal services and who can manage the lawyers you see a lower income advantage of being a lawyer because of that, that kind of competition. So, so generally the idea there is to eliminate, those are just two examples, but the idea is to eliminate barriers to markets and market competition that are particularly uh, pernicious when powerful interest groups are able to essentially write the laws at oftentimes at the state and local levels about who's allowed to compete with them. Thank you. Um, this is apparently the point where, where I'm meant to ask some kind of uh, deep and provocative question. Um, and I don't really have one, but one way of, of reading your thesis is that the US has effectively moved away from being a market economy and it's become an almost strictly rentier economy. Um, and I, I would tend to agree with that thesis, but I'm wondering why that happened and why a return to the previous status quo is the right answer. Um, and to put that differently, I really enjoyed all the negative, angry, unhappy bits of your book, um, but I found the solutions really powerfully wedded to this idea of market. And another way to put that, or to try to make that into a question is, is there really beyond constant and active government intervention, is there any way to stop a market becoming a rentier market? Don't markets 
especially under neoliberalism, actually tend towards monopoly and rentier structures. Those are great comments and questions, uh, raise a lot of issues. Um, so let me, uh, to, to, the, to the last point first, I think, well, yeah, there, so there's two questions there about, one about the change, has, has it become less market oriented? And then is it inevitable if there's more market, if, if sort of markets allowed to, to work and people are allowed to exchange freely, does, is it inevitable that the competition gets harmed? I don't think it is, uh, but let me go to the, the first point uh, about change. So I, I wouldn't argue that the US had better functioning markets back in the middle of the 20th century. And then the problem is they've become corrupted since. So one issue is, is that the economy in general has moved like every rich country from goods production to service production. And I think markets are easier to regulate. They're easier to work. They work easier in some ways when it's goods production. Uh, first of all, the international competition is, is easier uh, in, in, in agriculture and manufacturing. Obviously, uh, you can actually import literal tangible things. And so that helps keep prices down. That, that makes it harder for monopolies to be formed. Um, and, but for because we've had so many productivity advances uh, in agriculture and manufacturing, we've been able to, uh, as, as every rich country and most countries around the world have, expand into services to a, a tremendous extent. And one of them is healthcare. But the United States is very, another way the United States stands out in a, in a negative way from the rest of the world is that we invest an extraordinary amount in our healthcare and we are extremely inefficient. 18% of GDP, the United States goes to healthcare and it was, 1980 was only 9%. So I think that is one instance where the market has got worse. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that across the entire economy, workers have gotten worse because I think the manufacturing industry, I think the agriculture industries and mining and energy markets are working very well in the United States. And it's, it's hard to make really excessive profits. Uh, you have to be a really standout company like Apple or Amazon or, or Google to, to make very high profits in those industries. Um, but you can be a very mediocre dentist or doctor <laughs> graduates from the middle of your class and doesn't have any, isn't really contributing innovation or new ideas and you just open a clinic and you can make a lot of money and you can be in the 1%. Um, and there are, there are complicated reasons for that. I think it goes to some, I, I, get, I go into some of the history of this in the book as, 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 you, as you may know, but the, um, the American Medical Association at, at, at key points blocked competition for doctors when things could have been different. And, and the, now there's this competition between providers, doctors in particular, and insurance companies. And they're kind of at war with one another where insurance companies don't trust the doctors. So make them fill out all kinds of paperwork to prove that they're not being fraudulent. And the doctors have very strong incentive to overbill for services that are not needed by customers. And they're very uh, angry about all the paperwork they have to do. And so they just have this massive inefficiency where uh, doctors end up hiring people with degrees who are specialized in filling out paperwork. You can get a degree in filling out medical paperwork now in the United States. I, I and uh, <laughs> and uh, there's just a, a profound amount of waste. Uh, and doctors are unhappy and insurance companies are unhappy. Uh, about the way things are going, but doctors are very well compensated, so they're, they're reluctant maybe to, to, to liberalize some of these uh, these privileges that, that, that they have. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, let me interrupt because we have a yeah, few sure. questions from the audience. Um, and I don't understand the way these messages are. So what, there are two from uh, Vinay Sharma who has their hand up now. Uh, Vinet, if, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself, please just ask your own question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Hello. We yeah. Can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah, yeah. It was a great presentation from you, uh, Jonathan. So my basic question is that we, you know, regarding the, you know, low rates of, you know, the Federal Reserve and the, you know, the. Uh, uh, and the stimulus that they are providing at this point of time to the economy, you know, which is creating basically, you know, a lot of this faultiness uh, and asset bubbles, you know, as far as economy is concerned, you know, because a uh, lot of that, that is ba basically leading to, you know, MMT, you know, these uh, bailouts, MMTs and, you know, uh, and, and uh, so, and, you know, problems with the bond and the yield, yield market. So it is also, you know, one of the basic reasons, you know, that why uh, we are seeing, you know, that the uh, crony capitalism type of thing situation is basically building up in the, you know, economy. And uh, basically the some of the large corporates are the one who are benefiting because the savings are basically uh, heading towards, you know, tax savings and they are not heading towards the productive sectors, you know, of the economy. Where you know capital can be you know uh, better uh, can be better you know channelized and uh, can be better you know uh, can come up with better returns you know so savings basically there's the problem of excessive savings and the financial depression basically which is basically leading to you know the basically sa uh, savings basically from the bottom of half of the economy is basically being you know uh, completely getting wiped out you know because of this so uh, how do you see this you know issue with the low rates and also with the automation also because you know the automation is also causing you know low quality jobs you know and the yeah. jobs are basically so are, are not, uh, those are sorry two two big issues there yeah, thank you for that question uh the low interest rates the federal reserve how that's affecting things and then automation so i'll, I'll handle those two separately uh i i don't think the low interest rates are a big contributor and uh the, the main reason we, we have those is because there's been slow economic growth and, and, and you know big economic recession as a result of the coronavirus. But even before that, we were struggling from to even recover from the, the previous financial crisis and productivity growth had been very slow. Um, and so I, I, I think the low interest rates have been a good idea to try to you know, keep capital flowing. But I, I hear your point about you know, the risk of bubbles. And that's certainly a concern. Uh, what, we, what we've seen in the United States is fewer and fewer companies going public. And then uh, uh, the, the small number who are public are, are just having their stock prices go up and up and up and probably beyond what the revenue can, can, can support. But at the same time, there hasn't been, uh, there's no real correction in sight that I can see. And, and the, the companies that are succeeding in the stock market in the United States uh, you know, are companies that are doing great around around the world and are tend to do a lot of research and development and come up with innovative products. I'm more worried about the companies that are not publicly traded, that are not in international sectors, that are not being scrutinized by investors, the legal services firms, the the, the healthcare industry, and all of the you basically professional industry groups that are that are uh, enjoying the lack of competition and and are they're not they're not really a big source of investment because it's hard to get into those companies uh, some of this so I, I basically I would like to see a uh, more people have access to being able to invest in in uh, the stock market and enjoy that and I think this sort of democratizing that would be good. Uh, but I don't see that as, as, as the source of, of growing inequality. Now, to your point about automation, that, that is a real concern. I, I just recently did a review of, of the literature and, and an analysis for the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics on how automation is affecting income distribution. And uh, definitely for, for workers who are exposed to, to robots and automation, there's a real chance. Uh, I mean, I think that there is there is some downward pressure on wages, and we we can think of this as co as competition, as as if the robots were workers, and uh, and and it's it's another way that lower income workers are are kind of have an unfair situation that because nobody's automating the jobs of of these elite professionals, but people are automating the jobs of of workers who are doing um, these kind of routine tasks. Um, and so that does raise a number of issues. I think so far that hasn't been a leading contributor to what we've seen, but I, it's something that we need to, to do a better job of measuring and monitoring and providing robust retraining programs for people who are displaced so that they can be on the other side of the advantages of technology. 
Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question. We're very short of time, but I really love this question. Um, so as you probably know, Jonathan, the word meritocracy was originally the title of a dystopian fantasy novel about why it is terrible to reward people for their ability um, and the, the new nobility that that would create. And so the question along those lines is, why do we uh, prioritize talent? Why wouldn't your system uh, wouldn't your system exclude people with intellectual or developmental disabilities? Why should people with talent be especially recognized? And why the obsession with cognitive abilities? I think that's a great question. I'm very I'm grateful for it. So. One way of answering that is to think about, well, first of all, I just want to clarify one, one aspect of the argument. I certainly would not suggest that people who have intellectual disabilities or people who score low on you know, cognitive tests, literacy, numeracy, struggle with those kinds of things, should uh, you know, live in poverty or not you know, enjoy the advantages of, of economic growth. Um, I in the, in the kind of society that I imagine, there's robust safety nets available. Everybody would have access to, to health care. Everyone would have access to you know, basic needs, including housing. And um, you know, that, to some extent, the United States has some of these in place, but the, it's, the, the safety net is not as strong as it could be. So I'd, I'd like to see some improvements there. But uh, as to the, the broader point, just in terms of should people really be compensated anyway based on merit or not? I, I think as, I, and I argue this in the book that first of all, as a, as a species, we've, we care about fairness and fairness. One way we think about fairness is people getting what they deserve. And if that's, and that should be, there's a lot of tests with, with not with, with primates, but also as humans that, that suggests uh, that there should be some balance in terms of what people contribute and, and how they are paid or how they are compensated. And the compensation doesn't need to only be income. It, it, could, be, uh, it could be other, other forms of compensation, uh, such as uh, esteem. But uh, if you think of just even in your own organization, whether it's a nonprofit organization, a government agency, or a private business, uh, if, if somebody is doing more work uh, putting in longer hours or doing very high quality work, should they not get some some form of recognition, whether it's monetary or otherwise, in exchange for that? Uh, I think most people around the world we've polled about this would say yes. Um, also, when we think about, say, athletes or when we think about instances where performance is very easy to measure, such as uh, in athletic competitions, I think most people would agree that it makes sense for somebody like Serena Williams to just pick a, a star celebrity athlete should be paid more than the average female tennis player uh, because she's demonstrated that, first of all, she's better, but she's going to attract a lot more revenue because people want to watch her play more than they want to watch the average female tennis player play. And so if, if you paid them the same, that would be very unfair to her because she's generating all this revenue that would go to, to, to other people. Now, I'm not saying it should be, it should be you know, kind of exact and it would be impossible to try to tease out how much revenue is Serena Williams generated uh, from all the TV viewing and all the downloads and all the you know, sponsorships compared to uh, the average female tennis player. And that's exactly how much she should be paid more. But uh, yeah, I think that's for, that's for societies to sort out, that's for organizations to sort out. But there should be, I'd say there should be a positive relationship there. And I think that's consistent with how people uh, around the world think about fairness. Uh, and and that to, 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 the one final point was, was about cognitive ability. And, and yeah, I, I, cognitive ability is, is, is taken as, as a very rough proxy for uh, whether somebody is, is capable of doing the kind of professional work or uh, at a high level. Uh, I, I, I don't put, I personally, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with it at all. It's, it's, it's uh, I use it because it's there as a, it's something that's measured. There's a lot of limitations to it. As I pointed out in the book, it actually matters just as much what your personality score is. And somebody who is conscientious and emotionally stable, 
earns just as much money as somebody who scored very well on these cognitive ability tests. Uh, and has uh, and, and health is even more importantly related to these personality traits than these these cognitive ability measures. So, I yeah, but most of the analysis is just using it as a proxy to capture the the benefits of education, and and I think it, I think cognitive ability should be interpreted as as kind of the quality of education that somebody has received in a very rough way, uh, but that's all I needed to represent. Thank you, Jonathan, and you are perfectly on time. Um, I was just thinking throughout your presentation of a, a wonderful quote by Kate Pickett in her book, The Spirit Level, that I thought really summed your presentation up. Um, if you want to try the American dream, move to Denmark. Um, but I thought it was a, a really enough. interesting argument for social democratic capitalism. And I Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how people applaud on this because everyone appears to be muted. So, but, uh, thank you. It was a, a really eye opening, uh, really eye opening presentation. Uh, so, I have to say thank you to you. And then I have to announce that the next webinar is this Wednesday, the 10th of March at 7 p.m. It's called <clears throat> Decent Jobs and the Future of Work After COVID. Uh, the speaker is Sarita Gupta, who is the Director of the Future Work and Workers Programme at the Ford Foundation. Uh, I hope that you can attend this. I wish I could attend this, but I will be teaching a class at exactly that time. Uh, I will catch up, obviously, on video. Uh, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their attendance and their questions and to thank Jonathan once more for a really provocative presentation. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I don't really know what happens now. I guess we just wait for people to leave. Why not Ali uh, uh, ask me to stay on for another few minutes. Thank you, Jason. That. Uh, I appreciate the questions. Those are very good questions. You're welcome. Thank you.